This is Ferney Voltaire, a French village near the Swiss border. Apart from its obvious charm, it has one other great claim to fame. 100 metres below me is the Large Hadron Collider, the biggest scientific experiment in the world. Large because it's 27 kilometres around. Hadron, subatomic particles like protons or neutrons. Collider because it smashes them together to create energies enough to create new particles. There are four different experiments based around the European Centre for Nuclear Research's Collider. The one we're interested in is called the LHCb experiment, and it's designed to solve one of the universe's biggest and oldest mysteries. It is difficult, if I'm honest, and it's difficult because matter and antimatter are such foreign concepts. Tara Shears is a particle physicist from Liverpool University and a member of the LHCb experiment. When the universe was created, right back at the very beginning, what happened was that matter and antimatter were created in equal and opposite amounts. But the thing about matter and antimatter is that as soon as they meet each other, they blow each other up, just releasing light. And that went on right in the first second of the universe. But at that very same time, the universe was expanding, it was cooling down, things were moving less fast, losing their energy. And at a certain point, these annihilations, which were energetic to make more matter, more antimatter in this endless cycle, that stopped. And after less than a second, the universe was now made of the leftovers of those last meetings between matter and antimatter. And the fact that we are here, sitting here today, made of matter, means that there must have been very slightly more matter than antimatter at that point. Something, something, something has happened to tip the balance in favor of matter. Something about matter or antimatter that makes it that little bit different. And that difference, that's what we don't understand. That is what we really want to find out in our experiments. Everything we can see, touch and feel, and the things we can't see, like microbes and atoms, are all made of matter. It's what builds reality. And even though it sounds like science fiction, antimatter is also real. It's like a mirror image of matter, where the charges of its constituent particles are reversed. For example, anti-hydrogen has an anti-proton with a negative charge instead of the positive we're used to, and an antimatter electron or positron which has a positive charge. When matter and antimatter come into contact, the two annihilate each other with a relatively huge release of energy described by this famous equation, developed by this guy. I hate this question, but as a science journalist, you feel sort of obliged to ask it. Why do we need to know about the differences between matter and antimatter? I bet not many people know this, but medical scanners, PET scanners, that are used to detect tumours for cancer, but also to study the, the flow of your blood around your circulatory system, these rely on antimatter. When you go for a PET scan, you drink a tracer, that tracer contains a radioactive isotope that emits antimatter electrons inside you when it decays. And don't worry, don't worry, the amounts are really tiny. It doesn't do you any damage whatsoever. But what happens is that when these antimatter electrons inside you, they get sucked up preferentially where you have more metabolic activity like a tumor. And that's where they annihilate with the electrons in your body. And that can be imaged by the PET scanner allowing doctors to pinpoint exactly where your tumour or where anything else is. Antimatter is key to that whole thing. So it's not just understanding the universe, it's got practical applications down to treating us, our cancer. Antimatter not only holds the key to the universe, but holds the key to your medical treatment too. <laughs> The Large Hadron Collider was originally built to find the Higgs boson, a particle that would prove that a field permeates the universe that gives mass to subatomic particles. That success happened in 2012. The Collider was shut down twice after that to be upgraded so that it might operate at even higher energies that can deliver more data. Now the Collider is concerned with other experiments, 
all of which are designed to test our fundamental understanding of the universe, something collectively known as the Standard Model. So as I'm, as I'm researching this, as I'm trying to understand it, I keep coming across this phrase, the Standard Model. What is the Standard Model? The Standard Model is our theory of particle physics. It is, it is our best explanation for what the universe is made of at, at these really tiny scales, what sticks these things together, why they behave like they do. Our whole knowledge is encapsulated in the equations of this theory. And this theory is really, really good. It, it's so distressingly good that it predicts everything pretty much that we've seen in our experiments. And that's why we call it the standard model, because it really is the, the standard explanation for, for why the universe is like it is. The standard model of the universe is so important that CERN have even put it on a coffee cup. I'm not going to pretend to understand it, but this equation tells us everything we need to know about the interactions of subatomic particles in our universe as we understand them at present. But even this model has a couple of problems. The standard model really does have problems, and it sounds stupid to say that when it's such a successful theory. But the problem is that we know it's, we know it's not the whole answer. We, we know it's not the whole explanation of, of everything in the universe. We know there's stuff out there that just cannot be either contained in this theory or explained by it. And I'm talking about things like dark matter, this mysterious, elusive, invisible stuff out in the universe that's responsible for making stars rotate around galaxies in the way they do, but which we, we don't know what this stuff is. And our theory certainly doesn't predict it or explain it. Our theory doesn't even include gravity. And that is a huge oversight because we know that gravity exists. It's why I'm sitting on a bench. It's why I'm not out in space. And yet our theory cannot put gravity in the same equations that it can express the other forces in. It's really good, but it's an effective theory. It's not the whole answer. A really fundamental explanation would include gravity, would explain dark matter, would explain antimatter, and anything else in the universe as well. But how does banging subatomic particles together at almost light speed help us understand the problems with the standard model? Violin Belay works at CERN with the LHCb experiment. It's called the beauty experiment. Why is that? It's called the beauty experiment because its main concern was these B mesons. And the beauty, or more exactly the beauty quark, is one of the components of this B meson. And the beauty quark, and, and what's a quark? A quark is a fundamental component of matter. And to be more precise, the proton that is more normal usual matter is made out of three quarks and they are the building blocks of the protons. Okay, so let's stop there for a second because this stuff is really hard. A what? A B meson? So earlier we learnt that quarks are the fundamental building blocks of the universe, even more fundamental than the protons and neutrons they form. There are six different kinds of quarks, one of which is known as a beauty quark. A meson is a particle made up of an antimatter quark and a matter quark. If one of those quarks is a beauty quark, it's called a B meson. Now the thing about B mesons is that they're kind of extinct. They haven't been around since the Big Bang. So that's what the LHC does. It creates the energy by colliding protons to bring those B mesons back from the dead, but only for a millionth of a millionth of a second. But get this. It also creates B mesons that are made of matter beauty quarks and antimatter beauty quarks. And that's what lets the folks at the LHCb experiment tell the difference between matter and antimatter. With, the, with our uh, LHCb experiment, we try to study the antimatter and the matter that is produced in proton-proton collision thanks to our uh, proton collider. And then we study very finely the properties of matter and those of antimatter, and we compare and we look for differences. So you fire two normal protons together. Exactly. Yes, and then what happens? 
So these two protons, they come with a very high energy, actually. They have it's been because accelerated. Because the colliders accelerated them? Exactly. The, in the, the rings of the collider, they have been accelerated so that they have a high amount of energy. Uh, so in the last run, we went up until 13 TeV. And with this... TeV means? Terra electron volt. That's a lot. That's a lot for, right. for particles. Right. Uh, as you know, very often we say that one tera electron volt is the equivalent energy of a flying mosquito, oh. but you contain it in the size of a proton, which is million, million, million times smaller than a mosquito. So it means at that scale, that's a huge amount of energy. Exactly. Because we know energy, energy is equivalent to mass right. through E equals mc squared. It means that you can create whatever particle has a mass uh, corresponding to the energy that, that you put to start with. And in particular, the, the particle that we like the most, this B meson, is not a constituent of the protons. And so what we do is equivalent to taking two apples, giving them a lot of energy and making collide, and after the colli collision, getting pineapple, tigers, elephants, all kinds of new things. So things that we wouldn't normally see on Earth. Exactly, we wouldn't see it on Earth normally because this is very unstable matter. For the example of the B meson, it lives one millionth of a millionth of a second. A millionth of a millionth of a second, and you managed to study that. Uh, yes, that's the interesting part because as it has a very high uh, speed or rather momentum, it actually uh, travels far enough in the detector that we can actually see it traveling before decaying. And in general, it travels around one centimeter uh, in our detector. But, but what do these B mesons tell us about antimatter? So the very interesting with these B mesons is that in our proton-proton collisions, we can create the B mesons and we can also create their anti-particle, which is the anti-B meson, if you want. And so w once we have created the two, we can study very precisely the properties of the B meson and of the anti-B meson. And by comparing the two, we can measure precisely the difference between matter and antimatter. So we can see if they behave differently. Exactly. And you, you hope that they don't behave differently. Uh, we hope they do well, behave yes. differently so that we can explain the fact that antimatter has disappeared from the universe. Right. H have you found a difference? We have found some difference, indeed, between uh, matter and antimatter, but these differences are expected because in our current description of what we know about uh, particle physics, um, this description we call the standard model of particle physics, mm -hmm. it comes with some differences between matter and antimatter. There is a certain amount. The thing is, this amount, for what we can see uh, today, is not enough to explain the fact that antimatter disappeared. There's not enough difference. So, Vilain, we can't get down to actually see the detector. No. Why is that? No, because uh, the proton beams are now ongoing. Yes. And so we can't go down because there is a fair amount of radiation there. That would be very bad for us. It would be very bad for us indeed. And so we have to stay at the surface. But this is what's going on down there. This is what's a part, a small part of what is going down. Right downstairs and and this is what what is at the closest place to the proton proton collision right. so that's the part of our huge detector which is 20 meters long yes that is the closest to the proton proton collisions although on display here the detectors in each case are not mock-ups they could be put back together and used if needed so where is the proton beam going is it going through that but I can see cut out. Exactly, the proton beam, the two proton beams actually, right. because you yes. have one on each side, they come in the carved area in the center yes. and they meet around the middle of, of this detector. 
and then all the the new particles that are produced, our tigers and elephants, <laughs> they are emitted slightly away from the beam within the mirror-like areas here that right. are silicon. Yes. And this silicon is the part of the detector that allows us to know that a charged particle went through there. And this allows us to know the position where our beam meson decayed with the precision of around the order of 10 micrometers. So the Large Hadron Collider is throwing proton beams around like that. Exactly. And then you have this part of the detector and the rest of our detector extends only on one side mm -hmm. in, in this direction on 20 meters roughly. You have like a 20 meters long detector that can detect all kinds of different particles, identifies them, knows, tells us where they, they passed. And so that allows us to reconstruct what happened at the proton-proton collision and to study these particles. Outside, VLN has a much larger image to help us understand what's happening further downstream from the detector we've just seen. So where's the bit you were just showing me? Oh, is that it there? Yes, the bit I showed you is at the intersection of all the red lines. It's at the beginning here, and it's called the vertex locator of so, Velo. So the beam is meeting there, and then these spraying particles are the particles you've created? Indeed. So the B mesons, they decay very fast, and their daughters, yes. their daughter particles or children particles, are emitted, and these are the red particles that we see. These ones live longer than the B mesons. Uh, and these other particles, they are identified by other subdetectors that we, are, we see here. They are called rich, and they actually tell us what is the identity of the particles that went through them. They don't stop them, they just tell us, ah, that was the identity of this particle that went through. It's a bit like... Uh, I've just had a beam on come through. Exactly, yeah, well. like, uh, like uh, <laughs> the, the police uh, station, you know, that checks the papers of people. And then you have what we call trackers that tell us exactly where the particles pass by. So you can tell, basically, they took this track or this track, and that allows us to really measure the properties of these particles. And then we reconstruct everything back to the B meson that has been created. So why did you focus on beauty quarks in particular? Just because, for the simple reason that the matter and the antimatter versions of the beauty quark are the easiest to measure. The differences between them are the easiest to distinguish. And it makes it a really good laboratory for a really forensic look at what's going on. So you say it's easy, but you're measuring things that are taking a millionth of a second. It's not easy. Believe it or not, <laughs> it, even though the timescales we're talking about are millionths and millionths of a second, that's what our experiments are designed to be sensitive to. We build really sensitive, fast equipment that can make measurements capable of distinguishing particles that exist for that millionth of a millionth of a second, a beauty quark, so that we can identify it in real time. I mean, this is what our technology does now. So, so when you're measuring the differences between antimatter and matter, what differences are you measuring? When we make our investigations, what we're doing literally is just counting how many matter versions and how many antimatter versions of particles containing beauty quarks we end up with. And if there was no difference between matter and antimatter, we'd expect to see the same of both of them. But the fact is that we most often see more matter than antimatter. So even in the very short times that our experiment accesses, we're seeing the same phenomena that we think went on right at the start of the universe. And, and that's why we're confident we can use the results of our experiment to, to make inroads into what exactly is special about antimatter and why it behaves like this.